quicker you're here, the faster you go. That's why where I come from, the only thing we know is. Oh. Alright, everybody. What is going on? Welcome back to another video. As you can see, we're all decked out. In fact, we haven't just got the hat and the t-shirt. We've got the pants too, man. But this is um, this is the Ohio University Bobcats, and this is the Ohio State University Buckeyes. Okay? Is that right? I got it. I fucking got it. Not only that, we've got some beads, man. We've got the lucky beads. We've got the flag. Honestly, mate, we're all set. We're all set for an epic reaction. Now, he said in his letter, the only request for me to react to is the Michigan vs. Ohio State, the rivalry, which can be found on YouTube. It's an hour long video, and it is quite a pleasure to watch. And it explains the rivalry thoroughly. And uh, you know what? That is exactly what we're gonna do. It's gonna be my pleasure to watch it with you guys. So we're going to learn today about the rivalry between Michigan and Ohio State. Obviously, I'm on the, the Ohio State side for now, but uh, it's going to be fun, man. It's going to be the longest video I've ever watched, longest reaction I've ever done. So I want to say stay tuned. If you can watch the whole thing with me, <laughs> you're a fucking legend. I wouldn't expect you to, but uh, without further ado, let's get into it. So we got Ohio, Michigan. Michigan versus Ohio State, the rivalry. There it is, right there. 469,461 views. And it's only in 240. You are fucking kidding me. All right, Michigan. We need, we need better than that. The rivalry. Michigan versus Ohio State, the rivalry. Um, can we watch it on another platform? The rivalry, the rivalry. TV movie, 2007. On Amazon. Where is it? There it is. It's a DVD. And it's going to cost me $60. We're watching it in 240p. Damn. Oh well. It's all good. You know that feeling that you got in the pit of your stomach the night before Christmas? Yeah! Now times it by a million. Go on. Michigan versus Ohio State, it's a war. It's been going on for a hundred years. The maize and blue versus the scarlet and gray. Good versus evil. Ohio State being the bad guys. Michigan people are to be liked. Go blue. Sweet! First thing we're going to have to do is go maps.google.com and go... Yeah, actually, think, come to think of it, I know Ohio because of the fact that the, the Arnold Classic bodybuilding show is in Ohio, Columbus, Ohio. And I'd always thought I'd get there for that reason, but maybe it's going to be for football. So we've got... Oh, there it is. Okay, so Michigan, Ohio. So we're... We're west, uh, no, 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 east, sorry, east, northeast, northeast. Oh, we've got Kentucky, West Virginia, Penn State, Carolina, Florida, Georgia, Colorado, Kansas, Nebraska. Holy shit, Nebraska is right in the middle. No, so is Kansas. <laughs> Colorado. I'd love to go to Colorado and, and um, Go up in the mountains and train in altitude. That'd be cool. Anyways, guys, look, they're neighboring states. They're neighboring states. That's all we got to know. Let's let's get into this. This game makes get comfortable. The season. Hard course, match off the ball. That's where they're hatred. What's at 
state. Bragging rights. Bragging rights. Bragging rights. Bragging rights. If you're able to win this game, you're buying peace. You lose 365 days of pain. You've got to win the battle. All hell will break loose. Every year on the third Saturday in November, amidst a Midwestern haze and the rustle of autumn leaves, the Michigan Wolverines and the Ohio State Buckeyes meet for a football game. Twelve months of fevered anticipation are played out on a frosted green canvas on which strokes of maize and blue flash with scarlet and gray. Separated by less than 200 miles of heartland, these uneasy neighbors engage in one of the oldest most deeply rooted rivalries in American sports. Actually, I never even I never even thought Michigan with the big with the, the yellow and the blue is actually the t-shirt that I really wanted. And I got sent this one, right? I think I like this one even better. Cause honestly, the colour scheme, the red and grey, is super fucking sick. I love it. And I actually love the yellow and blue as well. But no, this is this is a brilliant t-shirt. I absolutely love it. And the hat. Predated and the, the Nick Bowl's first World Series by six years, and the existence of the NFL by a quarter century. It's football, spiked with an acute sense of identity. Insane crowds, man. Since 1935, the game has been held on the final week of the regular season, with the Big Ten Conference Championship and a shot at a national title frequently at stake. Fuck, that'll be a big game. But even in a down year, the chance to play spoiler to one's foe can be equally satisfying. Mm. Absolutely. Oh, oh, 27 with a big hit! Oh, shit! For a sacred 10 year period, two combative men inflamed this bitter rivalry while becoming folk heroes along the way. And for the players who carry the weight of tradition on their shoulder pads, the results of these games forever define their legacy. Who's going to dot the eye? Each university is steeped in proud custom, and for those to the north who have claimed to the winningest program in Division I history, tradition leads back to one man, a turn-of-the-century coach who made football an institution in Ann Arbor, the legendary Fielding Yost. Good old Fielding. He's here in 1901, he runs into an Ann Arbor news reporter who asks him about the coming season, and he says Michigan will not lose a game all year, and they didn't in 1901. 1902, 1903, and 1904. <laughs> 1901! He was the champion of the West during the early years. During the first 15 games between Ohio State and Michigan, Ohio State won none of those games. Field Union's Michigan team in 1902 defeated Ohio State 86 to nothing. Even worse from the Ohio State standpoint is that game was called about halfway through the second half. The official simply brought the teams together and said, fellas, it's 86 to nothing. I think we've probably had about enough. And it wasn't until the 16th game of the series, which was 1919, that Ohio State finally was able to beat Michigan. Far out. And the guy that Sounds like Australia versus New Zealand, Zealand in rugby. Was Chick Harley. With only a single loss in three seasons, All-American Chick Harley brought the Buckeye program to national prominence and inspired the construction of Ohio Stadium, which opened in 1922 with unique Whoa! design. 1922. While the Americans were still admirably living off the land, Michigan's burgeoning automobile industry provided the state with newfound wealth and stature. By the time Michigan Stadium was completed in 1927, the state's social and economic upturn was reflected in the university's growth into one of the country's premier learning institutions. And with the advances of the 20th century, came an aura of elitism amongst Michiganites. On the 
football field, the Wolverines continued to manufacture championships with assembly line proficiency. By 1933, Michigan had won eight national titles and had taken nine of its last 12 against Ohio State. There's 27. The era began with the prolific Benny to Benny connection of quarterback Benny Friedman and receiver Benny Husserbahn. Later included Grand Rapids raised future U.S. President Gerald Ford. The team from Ann Arbor seemed cut from a superior cloth, but in 1934, OSU's incoming coach, Francis Schmidt, broke through the mystique. When he was interviewed about the job, they were asking him, how are you going to beat Michigan? And he looked them right in the eye and he said, just remember they put their pants on the same way we do, one leg at a time. So when Ohio State beat them, they started the ghoul pants tradition. And ever since 1934, whenever Ohio State defeats Michigan, all the players and coaches get little replica gold pants. And that represents two of the fine moments in my life. Cool, man. I have several. I love, I love things like that. I love like little, little medals or little, you know, knickknacks, little, the rings, the Super Bowl rings. I just love the fact that they get those. It's a little memento just to remember such an amazing year or moment in sport and your sports team. Everyone in the team has one and you can always talk about it. That's fucking sick. Love it. Pants myself. I don't mention that around here. Gold pants were immediately in style as Ohio State thoroughly dominated the next four meetings, outscoring Michigan 114 to nothing. What? Hoping he's not, he, he's not, Michigan, <laughs> he's not holding that guy up. Dominated the next four Whoa! Meetings, outscoring <laughs> Michigan 114 to nothing. No. Hoping to reverse this unsettling trend, Michigan ushered in a new coach from the Ivy League who made his own sartorial impact. Michigan's new coach in 1938, Fritz Chrysler, had come from Princeton, and he created the winged helmet of maize and blue. It was done for two reasons. First, to dress up the helmet, because until then, Michigan just wore a plain old black leather helmet. But the second reason Put was some color they on wanted it. to have the passers be able to spot the receivers better. In truth, no one needed a winged helmet to spot the ubiquitous Tom Harmon. In the 1940 meeting in Columbus, Harmon rushed for three scores, passed for two more, and intercepted three November 23rd. Leading to a 40 to nothing Michigan win, and a standing ovation from the Buckeye faithful. Michigan added two more titles in 47 and 48 and held a decisive lead in the rivalry by the half century mark. But despite winning just 12 of the first 46 meetings, Ohio State was a heavy favorite in 1950 in what became the most fabled contest in the game's history. On Friday the night before the game, we went downtown to the National White Hotel about 9 30, 10 o'clock, and everybody went to bed. But it was the next morning that was shocking. <laughs> it was. Yeah, we just don't see that here. It was snowing big time. It was blowing big time, and it was about three above. Fifty thousand fans showed up. In Southwest Columbus, Ohio, a busy crew of snow shovelers worked through the night preparing the gridiron for the long-awaited clash between Michigan and Ohio State. A sudden you'd hit an icy spot and your feet would go right up from under you and you'd fall flat on your face. <laughs> I sort of lay there in the snow and I thought, I'm gonna be left here to die. <laughs> it's maybe the most unusual college football game ever played. There were 45 punts in that game. Far out. <laughs> So that means, obviously that means that, you know, no one's holding the ball with so many incompletions. They're going to get to the fourth, the fourth down, like, a lot. So 45 punts. And I'm thinking, I'm looking at people that punt in college football at the moment, and they're probably doing maybe, like, 10 punts a game per team, I guess. So it's over double. Is that, is that about right? 24 times. We must have punted on first down 10 times. Nice punts. And I could not see their defensive backfield. Oh, you punted it on first down ten times. Okay, because it was just 
too hard to, to, to catch. And unforgiving winds, the snowball turned into a game of hot potato. With each team punting the ball back and hopes the other side would make a mistake. <laughs> the Buckeyes capitalized first by turning a blocked punt into a field goal by the Heisman Trophy winner, Dick Jennings. Fuck, that was a, that was a toe punt if I ever did see one. Wolverines made the score 3 to 2. With under a minute left in the first half, Break my toe kick like chance that. to run out the clock and retain a half time lead, Ohio State coach Wes Fessler sent out his punter instead. Tony Watson, the center for Michigan, went through and blocked Janowitz's punt, fell on the ball in the end zone for the game's only touchdown. Michigan won that game 9 to 3. Without How could you sit there watching it? Seriously. And the field turns into a pendulum of overjoyed Wolverine Rooter. It's a great victory for Michigan. It would be fun, actually. So never coaches another day. At Ohio State, he's out. The Wolverines escaped Columbus and made an unplanned trip to the Rose Bowl. With snowdrifts reaching 25 feet, the Great Appalachian Storm of 1950 claimed the lives of dozens of Ohioans the job of yet another Buckeyes coach. Ohio State had long been considered the graveyard of coaches. The program search for its 19th field general, its sixth in 12 seasons, yielded the uninspiring name Wayne Woodrow Hayes. Woody, as he was called, had led impressive teams at Denison University and Miami of Ohio. But after three unremarkable seasons in Columbus, which included two shutout losses to Michigan, it appeared Hayes' tenure would last only as long as it took to dig another grave. But in 1954, a funny thing happened on the way to the funeral. The turning point in that season is the fourth quarter of the Michigan game. Michigan comes to town under coach Benny Oosterbaum and they take the opening kickoff and they drive the length of the field. The Buckeyes right before halftime tie the score 7-7. The third quarter is scoreless. So this play opens up in the fourth quarter. We took the ball down all the way to the one yard line and we had four shots at it. Michigan then rams that Ohio State line trying to get into the end zone and falls short. We had them on the ropes. Man, it was awful. That goal line stand at the south end of Ohio Stadium in the 1954 Michigan game was truly the turning point in Woody Hayes' career. Spurred by the defense. Oh, the running back. Bang off the right. Oh, oh the pace. At the 40. Propelling the scarlet and gray to a surprising undefeated season. The scarlet and gray. For a national championship. I like scarlet and gray. Woody's Buckeyes won 11 of 15 against the Wolverines. Crown national champions again. 57 and 61. Woody Hayes had finally jammed a wedge in the revolving coaching door at Ohio State. More military tactician than X's and O's strategist, Hayes won with a brick and mortar approach. Shunning the pass to three yards in a cloud of dust. In fact, Hayes' teams might have been called dull, if not for the man himself. I saw this older guy, real mild-mannered guy, and I didn't know he was General Patton in disguise. He's the guy you gotta hit him! You rush your butt off! Get off the field! He's the meanest sucker you've ever seen. I'll be a goddamn son of a bitch. You go bigger! Listen, in practice, <laughs> he would get so upset. For God's sake! That there was a fumble, or there was an interception, that he would bite his hand until it bled. He used to throw his hat down to stop it, and then he would grab the hat and just tear it apart. Snap his glasses. <laughs> he took the watch off, threw the watch down, and jumped up and down on that. He looked like a raving madman. Oh, <laughs> shit, look at that. <laughs> Woody Hayes once said, show me a gracious loser, and I'll show you a bus boy. You're damn right. If anybody gives you a compliment, kick him right in the shins, unless it's a lady over 80. But I tell you what, when you're out in practice field and you see that kind of emotion and intensity, hell, there's no question who will win. Everyone's game elevates. No question. Nobody would ever outwork him. When we came in on summer practice at 7 in the morning, he was passed out on a couch at the facility and the projector was still going. Obsessed. He fell asleep watching film. And he'd hear us and get up, get a shower, and go right back to work. He loves it. Hayes is what a legend. Dedication, Hayes. tyrannical temper, 
were legendary, as was his disdain for the maze of blue. He would never refer to Michigan by name. Anytime he referred to the University of Michigan, it was always that team up north. <laughs> they were recruiting a kid in Michigan. And they I like this guy. Sound, they actually ran out of gas. He said he would push his car across the state line before he would buy any gasoline in the state of Michigan. What he hates was everything we load. I did not like Woody Hayes. I didn't like anything about Woody Hayes. You know something? I couldn't care less about that. <laughs> it all stems from my father's incredible At least he said it politely. For his arrogance. And I don't think the players are worried about it any more than I. If I had to pick one evil force in my life growing up as a grade school student here in Ann Arbor, it should be Brezhnev or somebody. It was Woody Hayes. If there was any question that Hayes reveled in the enmity of his foes, the 1968 encounter left no doubt. It was a close ball game. It was 14-14. And then all of a sudden, bingo. Bang! He got shellacked. Is this game ever going to end? So as an on... We couldn't stop it. I could actually... We couldn't do it. I could come That's to true. America and watch this game for my birthday. Yeah. My birthday's on November the 27th. Well, High State just exploded in the second half and ended up winning that game 15-14. A lot of the Michigan players were pretty upset at the end of the game because after Jim Otis had scored his fourth touchdown, Woody Hayes sent the offense back on the field for a two-point conversion. And that was just to rub it in. That was just to stick it in our face. In the dressing room after the game, and one of the sports writers was asking Woody Hayes, hey, you were up by 36 points, the game's almost over, why would you go for two? His response, because they wouldn't let me go for three. <laughs> yes. This was a buzz with Buckeye fever. As Ohio State followed its win over Michigan by beating O.J. Simpson's USC Trojans in the Rose Bowl. The Bucks' fourth national title under Woody Hayes was salt in the wound of Wolverine fans who were experiencing something unfamiliar from their beloved program, mediocrity. A losing record over 10 previous seasons had turned a once packed big house into a cavernous memorial to past UN glory. People cared about Michigan football. But Look at the place. It's sort of fallen on hard times. You could go up to the ticket counter and buy a ticket and walk on in. And there were many times when I'd sit down in the end zone as a high school student and it'd be half empty. Can't have that. 1951. 1968, Michigan wins exactly one Big Ten title over an 18-year period. It's barely a rivalry there for a while. That all changed in 1969. 69. The headline in the Detroit newspaper said, Bo who? Bo who? Bo who? Glenn Schembecker got the nickname Bo from his little sister's attempts to say brother when they were young. Most everything else he got from Woody Hayes. The Barberton, Ohio native and son of a fireman was an offensive tackle at Miami of Ohio during Hayes' tenure as Redskins coach. Beginning in 1958, Schembechler studied under Hayes for five seasons as a Buckeye assistant. The lessons paid off during six winning seasons as head coach of his alma mater, Miami. Despite his success, Michigan fans were left to wonder how a coach with such unnerving ties to the enemy could recapture the program's once proud tradition then again, few are as keenly aware of Wolverine lore as a Buckeye. Michigan was not Michigan at that time. Michigan had a debt of a quarter million bucks. The facilities were a mess. They had Ricky Dio wooden chairs. They got dressed in the second floor of the basketball arena at the time. They hung their hats on rusty nails and two by fours bolted into the wall. We walked into the locker room that was supposed Sounds to be like Alice Springs rugby. here at Michigan and looked it up there and saw a nail on the wall. And we started complaining we had better facilities at Miami and this and that and both said, Better stuff at Miami. Gentlemen, see that working seat right there? Fielding Yost sat down in that seat. You see that rusty nail right there? Fielding Yost hung his hat on that rusty nail. We've got tradition here, Michigan tradition, and that's something no one else has. The first task was to get their attention, and he got it right away. He said, I will treat you all the same like dogs. <laughs> Hey man, you gotta do something drastic to, to get this program up and running again, man. He was the Tasmanian devil that came.
came into town in a whirlwind of dust, and we were left in his wake. He worked us to death. He had about 140, 150 guys on the team he took over. Every day, three or four people were leaving. He just waved at them on their way out the door. Guys were quitting left and right. At the end of spring practice, he's down about 75 or 80. In the locker room, Bowman put up a sign that said, those who stay will be champions. Those who stay will be champions. It Gotta is still stay. the mantra by which every Michigan football player lives because that sign still hangs in the locker room. It was Bo's sign. When he came in, he knew the team he had to beat was Ohio State. Ohio State was the scourge of the Big Ten, the scourge of the country. Ohio State is undefeated. They are the returning national champions. Sports Illustrated said they were so good. The only game worth watching right now in college football is Ohio State's offense versus their defense in full pack practice on Tuesday in Columbus. They were that overpowered. 200 miles to the north, those who stayed got off to an unspectacular 3 and 2 start. It's alright. But four straight wins, which they outscored their Fuck, that's a nice stint! 78 to 22 raised the Wolverines' confidence going into their season-ending matchup with the mighty Buckeyes. A game they had been thirsting for since Woody went for two. We had a great week of practice because we were all motivated by what Woody had done the previous year. Bo made every player on the team practice with a sign taped to his helmet that said 50 to 14. The score was posted all over the locker room. And I made sure they didn't forget it. Every demonstration player that was playing against our first and second team, getting ready for that game, or the number 50, everybody was 50. That was embedded in the minds of these guys. That embarrassment was not going to last long. 103,588 fans of Michigan State. Wow. 1969. Over 100,000 fans. First box guy jumps up and grabs me and shakes me and says, we're going to beat your ass today, buddy. The head coach of Ohio State, Woody Hay. I'm 11 and a half years old. I remember like elbowing my dad and saying, Dad, you know, Woody can't hear you. <laughs> we're in the 50th row. OSU, a 17-point favorite, led early. Michigan struck back with two Garvey Craw touchdowns. Oh, oh, still going. Billy Taylor's electrifying run. Then an unheralded senior from tiny St. Ignace, Michigan, got a hold of the ball. He's running away from us. We're in the end zone. And I remember him just running. We're kind of like pushing him. You know, like, go, go. Still going. Barry Pearson's 60-yard return set up another score. Time all season that Ohio State trailed in their mission. It only got worse. As Michigan's impenetrable defense snapped Ohio's 52 game win streak and secured the biggest upset in the history of the rivals. Oh, nice! <laughs> a, a flawless football game. Uh, I swore Bo was in the huddle. Woody was befuddled that day. Bo Schembechler, the student, out coach, the teacher. It was not a fluke. Bo versus Woody. Kicked their ass that day. Definitely patriotic to your own state, man. That game kind of set it off. Woody was crushed that his greatest team would be beaten. When Ohio State got back from that huge loss at Ann Arbor in 1969, Woody Hayes went right to his office and began working that night on the 1970 game. Hayes had a huge rug made that he put outside the Ohio State dressing room that the players had to walk over as they went out to practice every day in the springtime. And that rug said, 
Michigan 24, Ohio State 12. We walked across that damn rug every day. I still have the bumper sticker saying, remember Ann Arbor. Cars would have them on the back and be driving around. I mean, it was just amazing. When we got off that bus in Columbus, man, they were ready for us. There were signs on the dormitories. <laughs> they were not G-rated. <laughs> Woody was as tight as a drum. Don't you know who we play this week? Don't you know who it is? My God, it's Michigan. It's Michigan. And he's crying, and tears are coming down his cheeks. And I thought, oh. Big game. Man has really 1970. Michigan, and he's using it repetitively. The 70 battle in Columbus was a combination of all our frustrations that whole year. And it wasn't going to be pretty. Out for blood. I've been waiting a whole year to fucking do this. 20 to 9. Huh? Finding the flames of Ohio And it wasn't going to be pretty. Out for blood. Ohio State disposed of Michigan. 20 to 9. Ah, good stuff. Finding the flames of animosity between the schools. There were two men who brooded over the game with an angst that permeated through their programs and the regions as a whole. For the remainder of the decade, the regular season was mere window dressing for this annual year-end clash. A period remembered as the Ten Year War. Ten years. It became more real. And it became more Ten serious. year war between and these two coaches. You spent your whole year, you spent your whole off season getting ready for that one game. We thought of this one more than we have the rest of the season put together. When he brought his team up here, he would tell one of his assistants, he said, would you please tell Coach Schindler that I'm ready to meet him at the 50 yard line. He would not cross the 50. And so I'd shake hands across the 50. I would he, I will. And that was it. <laughs> for 10 years. I want to beat him. He's no friend of mine. The one thing that he said that really stuck out with me is he said, this is more than a game. This is the war. Everything happens. You've got it all. Intrigue, injustice, devastation. <laughs> you can go straight to hell. Every storyline possible. Well, step back up. Has to be a restraint. But he hates it. Ripped up the Dallas marker. I mean, who does that? Well, I don't know. Do, do all coaches get like this? In 1971, it's the first in a series of blood boiling close calls. In 1972, a defiant Schembechler twice passed up easy field goals, only to twice be denied at the goal line, resulting in a 14 to 11 Ohio State win. Both oh, what a run! The fourth ranked Wolverines played the top-ranked Buckeyes to a 10-10 tie. Statistically, Michigan dominated and fully expected a trip to the Rose Bowl. But a vote by Big Ten athletic directors sent Ohio State instead. The slight infuriated Schembechler insisted his team was robbed. This is the lowest day in my athletic career, either as a player or a coach, because I am bitterly resentful with the way this thing was handled. Painfully reminiscent of two crucial misses in the 73 game, Mike Lantry's just inches wide kick as time expired on the 74 showdown left Michigan with a two point loss. It concluded an excruciating <laughs> Those pads are pretty square. In which they won every one of their games, except for those against the Buckeyes. But Arch, I felt you had another great day today. And he'd rather have that victory than all those 31 games put together. Isn't that right? A local high school legend, raised in the shadows of the horseshoe, Archie Griffin rushed for over 5,500 yards in his four seasons as a Buckeye. Wow. It's going to be a record, right? Despite being college football's only two-time Heisman Trophy winner. Two-time Heisman Trophy winner? That's definitely something I haven't heard before. I didn't know if that was possible. Pants as his most satisfying awards. The gold pants is most satisfying awards. <laughs> His last pair came in 1975, which gave the Buckeyes a 4-2-1 advantage in the 10-year war. The rivalry reached the national stage, and tensions between the coaches spiraled from Midwestern machismo to Cold War paranoia. He stopped practice and he said, 
You see those two guys? Those are police. I hired them. Bo was trying to watch our practices. Never forget the year that Bo brought the police in and went to one of the apartments across the way. It gets bitter and bitter. The guy shooting a video camera over the top of the wall at their practice and thought he was a spy from Ohio State. Are the elements of my strategy all safe? How's the field going to be cut? Who's it going to favor? Woody was convinced one year that Michigan had a new shoe specifically made so that if the field were slippery, Michigan would have better grip. And Woody tried like crazy to find out so he could order some. And there was no secret shoe. We were playing Michigan. He's gone mad. My senior year, we were having our pregame meal. The ladies that were serving us were all nice looking ladies. I mean, nice looking ladies, college students. And all of a sudden, we heard that clank. He hit that wine glass with a fork, and he starts screaming. I want all of these waitresses out of here. I want the cooks to serve my men. And we're looking around, and what? And then he stood up and said, Bo planted them there to distract us. <laughs> Bo infiltrated our lunchroom. He goes, we'll have none of that. This guy's fucking lost it. Further provoked fan partisanship between the states. A fanaticism reinforced to this day. Whoa, that's a fast march. Side. This is not just a rivalry between two football teams. This is a rivalry between two ways of life. This is scarlet red versus maize and blue. This is a battle between goodness and evil. <laughs> <laughs> Michigan represents the good. You are a Michigan man. You stand for something excellent. You stand for truth. Oh, we're in the 80s now. Integrity. When you talk about a Michigan fan, you are talking about Satan incarnate. <laughs> oh, no. Makes me sick even to say the name of their state. We're very proud of the Wolverine. And we know that the Ohio State people have the Buckeye. And we also know that the Buckeye is a hairless nut. <laughs> Have you been to Michigan? The entire state smells like hot dog water. It's horrifying. We don't pay a lot of attention to the fans from a lot of states, as far as I remember. We like to think we're a little higher educated. They cause the arrogant asses as a result. AA is for arrogant asses, not Ann Arbor. We consider them just slightly redneckish. Go Bucks! <laughs> Go Bucks, dude! The University of Michigan always has been a hell of a school. I love the logo though. First rate academic school. Love it. Face it. Michigan was superior to Ohio State and remains superior. We had a Michigan guy flunk out of Michigan and then he enrolled at Ohio State and he raised a class standing at both universities when he did that. I'm a Michigan graduate. You're an Ohio State graduate. You're lucky you're not flipping burgers someplace. <laughs> you ain't okay. a bunch of pretend wannabe crybaby suck asses. We looked down our noses at Ohio State. You know why their noses are in the air? Because we have kicked their asses so far up into the air, they can't get their damn noses back down straight again. Fuck Michigan, excuse me. <laughs> Michigan has a great spirited fan base. Or in the no, 90s. Michigan has a great spirited fan base with violence, lunatic, sociopathic fringe attached to it. They're not embarrassed by anything, they're loud, obnoxious. Well, I guess I'm a Buckeye. I'm wearing this, this stuff. on the campus of THE Ohio State University. That would be so much fun. Do that thing that they just did. And also, apparently, to own five red hooded sweatshirts each. We're from Ohio, O-H! We're from Ohio, I-O! We don't give a damn for the whole state of Michigan. We're from Ohio, go, go, go. 
since when is being passionate about something bad? Yeah, exactly. Ohio State fans. But keep it on the field, guys. Crazy on the outside. Keep it on the field. Can't be having it spilling out into into the crowd like they do in uh, in the UFC, like McGregor did. Looks could be. Guys, this whole town lives and breathes and dies. six years old, I only missed one Ohio State football game until I was 20. Wow! That's all there was in Columbus. We didn't have Broadway plays, we didn't have opera, we didn't have great museums. This is what we had. When I was a kid, there were eight radio stations in Columbus. And on Saturday afternoons, all eight stations carried the Ohio State game. I don't know one kid from my high school that doesn't have a baby picture with Buckeye stuff. Well, that's cute, isn't it? The way the kids are raised, it's not a basketball state, it's not a soccer state. Um, it's a football state. It's a football state. <laughs> you have to understand that in Columbus, Ohio, Football is a secular religion. This is the evangelism of this part of the heart. Singular in its focus. In the manner that if you take a magnifying glass, and hold it over an ant in the sun. It's everything. I love Ohio State football. I'm a fan. I wouldn't say that I'm like a crazy psycho fan. I'm able to step back and realize that, hey, <laughs> Excuse me, it's, uh, I believe it's Coach Tressel calling. Yes, Coach. I don't know how many sets of ashes have been scattered somewhere near that field. It's a lot of people's wishes. Wow. It's a lot of people's dreams. That's... There's an O on that ball cap that they want placed in their casket next to them. You could talk to people in the autumn here wow. who want to live just long enough to see Ohio State kick the hell out of Michigan one more time. That's heavy, man. I could never figure out where this bile came from. I hate Michigan, I hate Michigan, I hate Michigan, hook the Wolverines. I hate Michigan, I hate Michigan, I hate Michigan, hook the Wolverines. I know the words already. Michigan and Ohio have been at each other's throats since people were writing down history on Fuck Michigan! Wolverine lost the Buckeye and there was many a black guy to attest to the upset. The game is over but the mayhem lingers on. Oh! <laughs> Big hit! Boom! <laughs> Fuck! King hit, mate. You'd be sent to jail for that these days. Before there was a football field to settle the score. In fact, it dates back to 1835, after Michigan had petitioned for statehood and discovered that through a land survey error, part of its territory, Toledo Strip, had been claimed by the state of Ohio. Michigan and Ohio militias engaged in an angry though bloodless border dispute that ended with Toledo remaining a part of Ohio. Nearly two centuries later, border towns like Perrysburg, Ohio are the disputed territories. <laughs> allegiance now up for grabs. Oh no. The Michigan Ohio border serves as a 70 mile long line of scrimmage, that creates a too close for comfort coexistence between rival fan factions. Be it in the classroom or at the local trading post, where a young Wolverine can be outfitted in maize and blue and a Buckeye nut. I do. I a freaking buckeye. love. I love both uniforms. I really do. I love both. I want both. That's all I gotta say. But weary travelers through these parts take heed. Knowing who the locals root for is Rivalry 101.
So there was John Kerry in Ohio before the presidential election, and he praises the Ohio State Buckeye football team. There is nothing better than Buckeye football, period. That's the way it works. But then he goes to a suburb of Detroit. We're roughly 60, 70 percent Democratic. Our high schools are named after John F. Kennedy and Harry Truman. Um, he could have said anything. The and then he mentioned himself, I just go for Buckeye football. I just go for Buckeye football. That's where I'm coming out. But... That was while I was in Ohio. Now I know I'm in the state of Michigan, and you got a great big M and a powerhouse of a team. This guy is a flip flopper. <laughs> what an idiot! <laughs> we believe the football in Ohio. He could have been killed. So the quality of the players are better. We feel no need to go across the board to get any of their, um, what they call talented players. It is no secret Michigan has long stocked its cupboard with Ohio natives. Living next door to one of the nation's most fertile grounds for high school talent, who can blame them? That it causes resentment in the Buckeye State only adds to the rivalry. But while some Ohioans are willing to cross the border in search of gridiron glory, for others, it's not even an option. My dad said, okay, where are you going to go? I said, Dad, I want to go to Michigan. And he said, you traitor. I'll tell you where you're going. You're going right down to 71 South, and you're going to play for the Ohio State Buckeyes. There was number 36, Mr. Spielman. Better not go there. Don't ever come home if you do. So, <laughs> there, that's good parenting, isn't it? <laughs> but where would Michigan football be without players from Ohio? It wouldn't be where it is today, I promise you that. Many of our best players come from the state of Ohio, and trust me, that really pisses them off. Uh, Jim Manage, number 88, El Diablo, the great All-American tight end. Obviously, Michigan is the better place. It's a very easy decision to make. And if that's smug Michigan arrogance, deal with it, Buckeyes. John Colasar's from Ohio, he kills us. Most. Charles Woodson, also from Ohio, ended up being a legend at Michigan. So I don't know what they did to Desmond Howard to get him. They must have had something on his family, or somebody was kidnapped or something. I stepped back and caught the ball on the seven-yard line. I made the first Where you going? Bang off the right. See ya. to my left. So now I'm running down. 1991. I'm like, that's that's just totally unfair. There's no way in hell he's gonna catch me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, pumps the people too, man. Should I not? Should I do it? Should I not? And I'm really wrestling with myself about this. I crossed the goal out like, hey, fuck it, and I did it. What do you do? You don't even have to say Desmond Howard, you can just say Heisman Powers. And it's just, oh God, it's brutal. It's brutal. The dream. Is that the, is that the pose of the Heisman Trophy? Is it? Look. <laughs> is it, did he just pull the pose of the Heisman? Was he going to win it? In Ohio, is to stop all these defectors if they could only build a fence around the state. Oh, they all come from Ohio, eh? Traders from going up north, then they could establish long-term dominance over Michigan, which might be true, but they've never been able to do it to their enormous frustration. They don't forget those who kick their ass. I just put. Why don't they want to stay in Ohio? Down, come on, man. I take this as a compliment. I tell them, thank you very much. Dad's man, you suck. Thank you very much. Dad's man, fuck you. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's the way. Let Three-time All Big Ten quarterback Rick Leach. The Wolverines put a blue and made stamp on the 10-year war with victories in 1976, 77, and 78. So it's 5-4. Beleaguered Woody Hayes saw his Buckeyes outscored 50-9 in the three games. The 10-year tally slide in Michigan's favor 5-4 with one tie. Woody Hayes, three years in a row. Way to bring it back, buddy. Later, Woody Hayes' career, 
ten year war came to a sudden shameful end. What? I was watching the game on television and I saw the punch and I said, you've just seen the last game Woody Hayes will ever coach. I was sad, but I understood that that was the only way that Woody could go out. He was like Melville's Ahab and ended up being taken down, pinioned to his obsession. <laughs> Football. Well, we're gonna have to see that again. This is like the sound of the punch. <laughs> He's got problems, bro. I said he'd lost it. I told you he'd fucking lost it. Told you. <laughs> Bros. Jeez. Football. Can't come doing that, man. Fuck. Can't punch your own players. This is Michigan. The biggest game I've ever coached, and the one thing I love to do is be a. And I looked over, and they had their helmets. Who's on. the new coach? They had a banner around here. They had something on it. And I was standing back there. I don't know how banner. What the heck are they doing? So I walked over there, and I saw Earl written on. I said, "Oh my God!" Earl Bruce had the unenviable task of replacing Woody Hayes, but in his nine seasons in Columbus. He became the third winningest head coach in Buckeye history and posted a winning record against the Wolverines. Well, that's, that's all it really comes down to, isn't it? But at the tail end of a mediocre season, Bruce was unceremoniously fired prior to the 1987 Michigan game. And Earl Bruce's final appearance for Ohio State, his Buckeyes are really playing well. Then you know the old saying, you find a way to win. Touchdown! They found a way to win. And it was all with the heart, not with anything else they did with the heart. Bruce's success Good work, was lads. immediate hit, but not in Columbus. I love John Cooper. John Cooper was great. Coach Cooper is a Hall of Fame coach. His dad say that. But again, when you're talking about Ohio State, you don't care what his record is. What's his record against Michigan? In the course of 13 years, they won two games over Michigan. So, poor job. John Cooper said, Michigan is just another game. He said that. His 1995 team was one of the best Ohio State teams ever assembled, featured Eddie Jordan. Whoa, 27. Winner at tailback. The Michigan team had already lost three times. They come into Michigan, and some guy that a lot of people, whose name they can't even pronounce, Kishimanga Biakabatuka, runs wild. Bomb off the left. Tim Biakamatuka. Biakamatuka. Biakamatuka made a name for himself. Bang! Rivalry record 313 yards, and spoiling one of several Ohio State seasons in the 1990s. Never fully embracing the magnitude of the rivalry, Cooper was replaced in 2001 by someone who clearly did. How about a great big Buckeye welcome for Jim Dressel? The day he was announced as Ohio State's head coach, ironically, Ohio State was playing a basketball game that evening against the University of Michigan. He said, you'll be proud of our young people in the classroom, in the community, and most especially in 310 days in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Thank you very much. Yes. Finally, we have a coach that gets it. When that day came that I got to roll up my sleeves and go to work and see if I could be worthy of coaching at The Ohio State University, I knew one thing for sure. I've seen I better be prepared. For I've seen this guy before. Sound like any other. I keep talking Trestle up to every NFL owner I see. I got to get this guy out of Columbus. This guy's got to go away. Jim Trestle, a coach's son from Mentor, Ohio, delivered in his initial test against Michigan in 2001. A victory over the Wolverines the following year secured a berth in the national title game versus Miami. And the Buckeyes are headed to the desert. Under pressure, throws it. Incomplete. The Buckeyes win. Now the party begins for the Ohio State Buckeyes. 
Tressel's record of success against that team from up north, five wins in six seasons, evoke memories of Woody Hayes. Long forgiven for his controversial exit, Hayes remains a larger than life figure. <laughs> they forgave him for cracking that guy. If you say Woody, it can only be one. Jeez, it was in the throat, too. Right to the throat. I bet you it didn't even hurt. And it's a little bit like being Still. in love with a very beautiful woman who has a broken nose. He actually threw the punch, and then he's like, fuck, what did I just do? And then he like grabbed his jersey as if to say, oh no, I didn't mean to do that. Woody is our Elvis. You can go anywhere, and there's going to be posters of Woody, pictures of Woody. There's going to be old men dressed like Woody. I've got two pictures of my workout room at home, and one of them was Woody when it's snowing with a short sleeve shirt and his little Woody hat on. That was him. I like the hat. I do like the hat. Woody Hayes cared about Ohio State University, cared about the state of Ohio. He's meant so much to so many people, and that's something that they'll never ever forget. Hayes' bond with Ohioans was unmistakable. And when the smoke cleared from the Ten Year War, a deep connection was a supposed nemesis. Their on field bravado no longer casting a shadow on their mutual affection. When he realized it or not, I was his best friend in coaching. I was his best friend. When I had a heart attack at the Rose Bowl, he wrote me a very nice letter. When I came back and was recuperating in my house, he came to see me. He's the type of man that has brought great credit to college football. He's a great, great friend of mine. He always will be. Your whole life pivots around one game. Your whole life is devoted for one purpose, and that's to beat the other guy. Who else in the world could understand you? Bo and Woody respected each other and loved each other. I gotta be honest, there is no there's no real rivalry between coaches in rugby that I can think of. You know, no like nothing that runs as deep as this does. Well not in New Zealand I rugby anyway. At the Guns Club in Dayton. They had talked to Woody earlier in the year about coming down and introducing me. He was too frail to do it. But he would not. He would not take no for an answer. So he had a kid ride him down in his truck. He could hardly walk. And he got up there for a half hour and talked about our relationship. His voice was not as strong as it usually was, but you could hear a pin drop out there. He's just a good man and a great, great friend. His friendship, I can't tell you how much I
third Saturday in November of 2006, the Ohio State Buckeyes and Michigan Wolverines met for the 103rd time. Both undefeated. It marked the first occasion. Both undefeated. The game at the number Shit. one and number two ranked schools in the country. Wow. And once the curtain was finally drawn, these century-old rivals put on a show for the ages. The game unfolded like a celebration, a hundred-yard homage to all who played, coached, and cheered throughout this storied rivalry. Oh, I'm getting goosebumps now for the first time. In the end, the schools combined for the series' highest point total in 99 meetings. It was Ohio State which prevailed 42 to 39. Oh shit! Crop of victors in Buckeye lore. What a hit! To win that game, so great and separates it doesn't matter what side you're on, but to win that game each year, ah, that would be epic. I cannot wait to watch it this year. It's next month. It happened at the same time, so there's a sense of when it happens. So you feel like you're not just seeing a game, you're seeing the historical event that you remember. Yeah. You're not just watching that year's game. It's a not at all. Thing. something that stretches from before you existed and will be here long after you are gone. Yeah, that is one way to, to really make you realize, you know, how much this means. I was born in 1990. We've been watching shit for, from, from 1900. 90 years before I was even born. My parents weren't born. My fucking grandparents weren't born. That's history. It was with our grandparents. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's the way it was with our parents. It's the way it is with us. It's the way it's going to be with our children and grandchildren. The cold, dark, forbidding sky of that late November day in Ann Arbor or in Columbus. It does set tone for the whole winter with either being a victor or having been humiliated by your rival. If you don't think it's a big deal around here, ask the guy who lost it. Yeah. It's a stigma you carry for 364 days to get a chance to remove it and get that blemish off your soul. They look at gray flannel skies for months on end and you're thinking about we gotta beat those sons of bitches the next time. How do you make Michigan cookies? Put them in a big bowl and beat them for three hours. How do you get an OSU grad off your porch? You pay him for the pizza. <laughs> what do you call a Michigan Wolverine with a national championship ring? A thief. <laughs> I like the other one better. A Michigan fan and an OSU fan are in the third grade. Who's bigger? The OSU fan. He's 18. That's a good one, man. I like that guy. 
He's been practicing those for about 60, 70 years though, so, you know. Get an OSU graduate off your front porch. Pay him for the pizza. That is just brilliant. You could use that for any school. <laughs> oh, that is just brilliant. But we're going to have to see where this year's game is being played. Michigan, Ohio 2018 game. November 24th. And they're giving it a 72% chance of winning to the Ohio State Buckeyes. And it's being played at Ohio Stadium. Boom. Well, guys, that was it, man. I didn't know if we'd get through it. I honestly didn't. I didn't know if you guys would get through it, but if you're still here, man, I want to say thank you so much. Thanks for sending me this gear, the guy who recommended me watch that. I want to say thanks. I want to say I hope you enjoyed. We, uh, we watched it in 240p, but it was fine. And I really, I loved it, man. I really loved it. And I love this top. And I love this, and I love the hat, and I love the pants, and I love everything. But I also love Michigan as well. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not taking any sides. Although the fact that I've received this before I've received anything from Michigan means that I sort of do have an affiliation with these guys now. But, you know, I'll work all that out. But if you have enjoyed this video, guys, please press like. If you want to subscribe for more, please do. And I'm going to have a break. So I want to say see ya. Have a great day. Peace out.